You're listening to Don't Waste Water. I couldn't make two cents of it. I was like, how does anyone make a business doing this? This is going to take forever and there's tons of unknowns. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Waste Water podcast. We were running ads, dinky ads. Like we barely had the ability to create the graphics we needed. We had no idea of what copy was going to sell a water test. We had a storefront that was built by an entire team that had never worked in the water industry before. And we were still able to make money selling water testing kits. And more importantly, we were able to make people happy. I'm your host, Antoine Valter, and in today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Johnny Pujol as my guest. You've made a company, you've filed the paperwork, you have some money in the bank, you've learned a lot. Before you throw this thing out, what's working? Johnny is the CEO and co-founder of Simple Lab. It was working. But I was still selling vacuum cleaners on QVC and other sorts of ways of making money. Very scrappy. And I remember him sitting me down <laughs> and he's like, I need you to take this seriously. This is working. And if you don't take this more seriously, we're not going to succeed where we can succeed. You need to stop doing the QVC stuff. Stop selling the T10s. Focus on tap score. And I did. He was right. That was when I started to pay myself. Simple Lab revolutionizes lab testing with a cloud-based platform that simplifies environmental data analysis. <laughs> Some weeks ago, I received a letter from my water utility. I won't give names, but it's a French company with a red logo that starts with a V. Too specific? Well, not a big deal because I actually found it very nice and transparent of them to send me that letter as it informed me that they noticed the PFAS level in my drinking water to be too high and they would put remediation in place. But while that got me thinking, gosh, what will they put in place, ion exchange or activated carbon, that same letter had a much different impact on my neighbors. All of a sudden, I noticed that everybody had switched to bottled water, which you could tell by the monstrous amounts of water packs they were loading in their supermarket carts. Now, on my bicycle path to work, I'm crossing a water lab in the next village down the Rhine River, so one day, out of curiosity, I reached out to see if they would be interested in putting a content piece together with me and test some water I would sample for them. They're an accredited lab, so I honestly didn't think twice. Well, I should have because they told me they don't test PFAS and as that was my follow-up question, they don't test micropollutants either. So that idea went down to my graveyard of ideas and I moved on. But think of it, if I'm really concerned about PFAS at my tap, should I wait for Veolia to send me another letter. Oh shit, no, I revealed the name. And even if they do send me one, how often do they test PFAS? I really trust them, yet I understand that my neighbors can have concerns. So what did it solve it to conveniently get that water tested? Well, for 283.95 euros, which is oddly specific, <laughs> I could get that done thanks to Tapscore, the B2C arm of Simple Lab. It's still good money, but I could share the cost with my neighbors. And it would save me the hassle of calling the labs one by one until I find one that does the test and accepts individual customers. So what's the story behind Tapscore and Simple Lab? What are established labs thinking of it? Should it be a concern or a chance for water utilities? And what's the link between Johnny's story and Instagram's path? Well, those are just some of the questions we'll answer in a second. Remember, if you like what you hear, please share this episode with a friend, a colleague, your boss, or your team, and I'll meet you on the other side. Hi, Johnny. Welcome to the show. Hi, Anthony. Thanks for having me. I'm pumped up about that one. When I was looking up Simple Lab and Tapscore, I wondered what was the first challenge that you wanted to solve? Was it the B2B part where utilities want to test their water? Or was it the B2C part where customers want to test their water? What's the number one if you have to pick just one? It started with the consumer, the customer, the person at home. Since the beginning, there was tap score. There were people at home who wanted to know what was in their drinking water. They had questions, concerns. We started really focused on the individual mom or dad, somebody who didn't have a background, a professional background in either analytical chemistry or in toxicology or water quality or water at all. That was our first customer. But isn't it tricky to have these two different end markets, basically the, the the two ends of the same market, isn't it a challenge as a pretty young company? Yeah, and I wouldn't necessarily do it again. Uh, <laughs> I think you find ways to make the most of the opportunities in front of you. We initially went to the place where there was the most demand and the least amount of supply. Don't quote me on my econ 
terminology, <laughs> but businesses weren't helping people at home test their water. It was a really unchartered territory. Laboratories didn't like walk-ins. This is their terminology for small customers, usually residential customers who call up a laboratory and want to do a water test. Of course, Flint had transpired and that tragedy really woke up a lot of people to the question of water quality. And so suddenly that disparity between people wanting to know what was in their water and laboratories chiefly being responsible for answering that question, the disparity between those two sides presented an opportunity that we were present to answer. We started down this consumer path because because of that heat, there was traction. We were able to run ads on a very basic Shopify store and actually have a great ROI on those ads quickly. Meaning to say people were searching for water testing kits and we were running ads, dinky ads. Like we barely had the ability to create the graphics we needed. We had no idea of what copy was going to sell a water test. We had a storefront that was built by an entire team that had never worked in the water industry before. And we were still able to make money selling water testing kits. And more importantly, we were able to make people happy. Namely, they would like tell their neighbors that they bought a water test kit from TapScore that they liked it. And so it just worked. People came and bought from our store. And this consumer business of mytapscore.com took on a life of its own, became really successful in spite of us not having a lot of background in these fields. We'll go into the depth of that. But if I'm right, today, the part of your business, which is, I mean, both seem successful, but the one which seems to be taking off even faster than the other is Simple Labs, so the B2B, right? I hope I'm not being arrogant in saying that, like, honestly, they're both still taking off. We've been incredibly lucky. I don't think it's not without explanation. Someone once said it's, you know, it's easier to make sense of what you did in hindsight than it is, you know, looking forward. We never had a great idea about how the future was going to look, pursued it, and everything actually worked out that way. What really happened is we focused on individuals who needed water tests. There were people at home who knew nothing about drinking water quality, who were scared of like snake venom and microplastics in their water, and they knew nothing about how to get the answers they needed. And so we got obsessed with answering that question with them, for them, building like a product that held their hands and told them about their drinking water quality, no matter what their questions were, right? So that focus ended up teaching us about the user experience of laboratory testing. So that obsession with the end user, with the individual, turned out to be just as applicable and helpful for businesses and engineers and fancy people who sign contracts for software. There was this awesome learning experience that transpired in those first three or four years of just tap score, where we got the opportunity to really sit with every little nano step of the experience of getting a water quality test. And then we learned just almost by luck that the business community had many of the same questions. And so we said, okay, aha, there's an opportunity here. Now, tap score isn't going to work as a water testing solution for large utilities or engineering firms. It's too consumer. It's very friendly and helpful and it's awesome, but it's not the kind of service you would deploy for compliance testing. So there are differences, but I want to hit home the importance and the value and just the awesome experience it was to kind of spend so much time with the consumer early on and how that really informed Simple Lab, our bigger business today. Before going into the full story, talking of Simple Lab, what would be your elevator pitch to the company as it is today? And then we'll see how you shaped it. Streamlined sampling kits and laboratory testing. If you've ever collected water quality tests before, you've experience the decision paralysis of what lab am I going to use? What methods am I going to use? What MDLs and RLs? There's all this technical jargon. Then there's the actual collecting of the sample. Are you rowing out a boat into the middle of a pond? Are you collecting it from a tap? Are you going out after a major rain and collecting it from a sewer? There's a lot of really complex questions there. We make all of that easy. You can be anyone. And with Simple Lab, we've streamlined that whole experience of like ordering test kits. Understanding is key. Even if you think you're a brilliant analytical chemist, you might not know how to row the boat out to the middle of the pond. And this is the case for you know many elements of our customer base. We just make that whole process of ordering test kits, collecting the samples, sending them into the laboratory, getting the results back easy. That's kind of what the software does. It just simplifies what was, I think, hitherto a very complex series of, of questions people were often unfamiliar with. You're hitting home with me, you know. Uh, I used to, before being a goofy podcast host, I used to be a water professional. I'm still a water professional. And I was ordering lab tests because we were 
working on, on micropollutant projects. And so I was collecting samples and sending the samples because we had one lab, which was a partner lab. And then they would call me and say, hey, do you prefer GCMS or, or LCMS? I was like, like I care. I right. want to know what's inside and I have no clue what jargon you're using. So I got to learn the jargon, but if I could have avoided that, I would have been so thankful. So it hits home with me at least. So I guess it, I hope it does with the people listening to that. But what I found super fascinating with your founder story, and you'll tell me if I'm right with that, is that that's absolutely not the place where you started. You were building an arsenic removal water tank. And if I get it right, oh, yeah. in order to... To remove arsenic, you probably need to test your water to get the level of arsenic. And you found out that that was an even bigger problem to solve. And hence, you pivoted towards that. What's the story of the arsenic removal tech? Does it still exist? And how does the pivot happen? For three months, I worked for a consulting engineering firm, Corolla Engineers. I'd done graduate school work in water quality and specifically on the use of electrochemistry for arsenic and other heavy metal remediation. I'd worked at this consulting engineering firm. I just, it, it wasn't working for me. I couldn't see myself spending the rest of my life doing it. All of a sudden, an opportunity came about to be a principal investigator, a PI on a grant that included a commercialization budget, an academic style grant that had a commercialization budget. And one of my advisors from Berkeley pinged me and said, hey, would you be interested in this? And he probably never finished asking me the question. I was just like, yes. And the commercialization was of a technology called ECAR, electrochemical arsenic remediation. It had been successfully piloted and deployed in Southeast Asia for arsenic removal using low-cost local materials. And the question was, could it be, what's the word, boomeranged? I may have forgotten. There's a terminology for when you take a, a quote-unquote third world technology and try to apply it in California's Central Valley, which is what we were trying to do. ChatGPT tells me, trickle up innovation. If that sounds appropriate, awesome. If not, come tell me in the comments or send me a mail and pack to Johnny's story. Take that technology, adapt it for the US, where there are, as many people know, are many arsenic issues. And for small water systems, those arsenic issues are a real frustrating quagmire because you do not have the money to solve the arsenic issue, but you know you're in violation. And people in town just kind of put up with that. So many small water systems have this kind of issue, especially the very rural ones, and particularly ones in the Southwest. We were going to take that technology and try to make it work in California. We set up near Edwards Air Force Base in a small town. We ran our, our own pilot. We built our own pilot, which is very funny because I'm not an engineer. <laughs> I thought I was becoming one for sure, right? Like I was like, yeah, this is happening. I'm going to be a real engineer. But, you know, a couple months in, I was looking at the numbers and learning more about how you build a technology like that, how you take like even a functional technology out of an academic lab and one that has been proven even in the real world and try to make that a product you can sell and make money off of in the United States in particular. And I couldn't make two cents of it. I was like, how does anyone make a business doing this? This is going to take forever. And there's tons of unknowns. And so I remember sitting down with my father, actually, and explaining this to him. And at the time, I was selling vacuum cleaners on QVC, which is like the um, American... If you've ever watched Shark Tank, you, you know what QVC is. <laughs> that was how I was paying bills for a while. The water thing wasn't working. I mean, it, technology was working, but business-wise, just didn't make sense to me. And so before throwing in the towel, I had a conversation with my dad and he was like, what's working? What is working? Before you throw this thing away, you know, you, you've, you've made a company, you've filed the paperwork, you have some money in the bank, you've learned a lot. Before you throw this thing out, what's working? And I said, okay, well, we're going to these towns in Central Valley. And uh, the best part about it is that when we tell them what's in their drinking water, because we've run a test, everyone is listening. They love it. They want to know about arsenic. They want to know about uranium. They want to know about pH. They want to know about TDS. And they're curious about all these heavy metals. It's like suddenly the quiet classroom has come alive. So I told him that and I was like, there's the answer. And he said it right like at dinner. He's like, you should just sell water tests. And at first I did that thing like every son does when their dad gives them advice. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you have no idea what you're talking about, old man. But he was right. And we, we, we pivoted at that point. We built a basic Shopify store. We ran ads on Google, built a new team that was specialized in this new endeavor, selling water tests. And then it just started working, right? Like the magical thing happened. People were buying them. The store kept growing and we 
recycled the revenue back into the product, run more ads. And when you have a positive enough ROI, you can do this. You know, you can just sell product, take the money, sell more product, take the money, sell more product, improve the product. And that cycle, that virtuous cycle begins and really has been since day one, one of our secret sauces to our growth of Simple Lab is that we never had to do a lot of fundraising. You do realize how aside from the no fundraising needed, you're describing the iconic Silicon Valley story. It just reminds me of Instagram, you know? Before Instagram was Instagram, it was Bumble, and you could do a bunch of stuff which nobody wanted to do, like pin where you were, tell a lot of stuff about all those places. And actually, there was one tiny little function which was sharing pictures. And that's the one which sticked. People loved the sharing pictures. So they got rid of everything else. They kept the sharing picture, and it became one of the largest social media uh, of our times. So it sounds like like very similar to, to your, your Simple Lab story. I have a question. Does your dad have an entrepreneur background or was it just common sense? He does not. Not I mean, he kind of does. Oh gosh, I hope he doesn't hear this. I don't know if he knows if he has an entrepreneurship background. I still don't really know what makes a good entrepreneur. And I know that's a whole conversation, a whole book with the whole library. But no, he's not a, like a famous builder of businesses, a titan of Silicon Valley. He was a, a, a former investment banker, though, in New York City. And so uh, was very competent. There is some logic. With what, <laughs> yeah, very competent at like understanding what works and what doesn't. So I, when I explained to him the numbers and the risk factors of selling an arsenic removal technology, it didn't take him two blinks to agree with me and say, Okay, yeah, yeah, we need something else. When I listen to your positive ROI from day one and Shopify story, it sounds like something which is a success story from day one. Yet I listened to you in an interview you gave to Sean Grady, and you said that the traction starts in 2019, and to quote you, 2017 and 2018 were ugly. And I'm the silly French guy here, so I'm super curious about what was so ugly about that if you had a successful Shopify and Google Ads running. Gosh, I might be getting my dates jumbled, but yeah, the ugly period was when we were making that transition. I see. It is, you know, I'm summarizing what was probably a year-long trans transformation. And my co-founder, a guy named Julio Rodriguez, who came on shortly after my father and I had this conversation, he had been kind of helping us test this out, experiment with this idea of selling test kits for the first year. And it was working, but I was still selling vacuum cleaners on QVC and other sorts of ways of making money. Very scrap. And I remember him sitting me down. <laughs> Julio was like three or four years older than me, so this sounds funny, but he behaves like he's 30 years older than me. <laughs> Anyway, he sits me down and he's like, I need you to take this seriously. This is working. And if you don't take this more seriously, we're not going to succeed where we can succeed. You need to stop doing the QVC stuff. Stop selling the T10s. That's a whole side side quest we won't go into right now. Focus on tap score. And I did. He was right. So we focused on tap score. And that for the first time, that that was when I started to pay myself. Having like your, your fingers and your feet in like 10 different pots suddenly became, okay, one pot. That was that experience of, of messiness, I think, was just like kind of closing up all those doors and just focusing on the one thing. But on that initial Shopify, on the very first store, what's your product like? Because you said very rightfully that 2015 was the Flint crisis. So I would expect lead testing to be like a superstar. And if you were selling it at the time for the $45 per test, you're selling it today that must have really got a lot of traction. You mentioned arsenic. Uh, I just did a bit of study and, uh, and apparently 43 million US people get their water from private wells. So at some point, they will need to get some indication of what's in the water. Was all of that existing from day one or what's the first product or the first set of products? At first, we had a single test kit. We didn't know anything about laboratory testing and little did we know it was a rabbit hole that very few rabbits have attempted to go to the end of. We were at the very beginning of that journey. We sold one test kit that we were like, yeah, this is the water test. And soon we realized, gosh, all these people are asking for other testing kits. Some of them just want lead. Some of them want microplastics and PFAS and pharmaceuticals. Some of them have really dirty matrices, like effectively pond water. Others are pulling this from a post-RO filtration system. Okay, so we need to handle different matrices. And so some of them also have microbacterial concerns, microbiological concerns that need to get to the lab right away. So we need more labs and we need to learn more about these different tests. And we need to start combining these tests into different packages and different kits. Ah, I see the business is happening now. We have to inventory all the materials we need so that we can build all these testing kits, so that we combine all the possible tests people are going to ask us for 
easily. And then we need the labs we can send those kits to. So when customers finish collecting their sample and they send it in, boop, it always goes to a certified laboratory that can run the analysis they want and they need. But in the beginning, there was just one test. Yeah, it was quite pathetic. <laughs> I like how you're fuddly negative about your, your first product, which which I, I wouldn't expect to be that scrappy because given the path, it must have hit a nerve. So you mentioned how you needed limited fundraising. Nevertheless, I had your VC on that microphone a while ago with John Robinson from Measuring Ventures. If I'm right, he invested in Simple Lab, so the mother company right. today. At what point do you add this B2B part and why did you need fundraising for that one, which you didn't need for Tapscore? Well, in the beginning, actually, when John joined, we were still just focused on Tapscore. And he had effectively invested in Tapscore becoming a B2B product. We didn't really know what that was going to look like yet, but it put yourself in 2019, 2020, everyone's talking about B2B solutions and SaaS. And we were drinking the Kool-Aid like everybody else. And we're like, well, we've got this decent direct-to-consumer success story here. Let's do the thing. Let's sell B2B SaaS. And we got swept up in that conversation just about like Sorry to, to cut you off here, but that's super counterintuitive. You have a B2C testing kit. Turning that into B2B SaaS sounds <laughs> like really a maze to solve. Yeah, and it, didn't, it also didn't work. <laughs> we tried it for a couple of years. We were like, oh, let's build a SaaS product. You get the great valuation. You have to just constantly listen to what your customers actually want. And our customers did not actually want a SaaS product. And no matter how we dressed that SaaS product and tried to convince someone it was, we were just doing all the things I don't like doing. I don't like having to sell people so hard on stuff. I want to give people like this, the, the case of Tapscore, like make it really easy. I want to make it so easy for people to choose our product and our solution that we don't need to sell anything. And we were betraying that when we made this really brash attempt to jump from D to C to B to B. Now, in that process, we built a really high functioning B2B product. We just don't sell it as a SaaS. It's free. Go on, create an account. You can use Simple App. We just decided not to monetize it that way. We want businesses to come in to use us as they see fit. And if there are reasons for like a more intense integration, okay, yes, we'll charge a subscription fee, but it's pretty unusual. In 2019, 2020, we were making that that jump like everyone else and trying to make that work. We had reason to believe it would work. We knew we had built something special by accident, <laughs> this laboratory network. We'd called up and spoken with, at that point, probably about 100 labs. And we'd figured out, okay, well, what instruments do they have? What certifications do they have? What FOAs, uh, FOAs, fields of accreditation, could they address? We'd indexed those capabilities. We'd given them the opportunity to bid on samples, give us pricing and turnaround times. So you could kind of put an order into Simple Labs Network and know very quickly who could test it at what price at what turnaround time. And you don't need to call four labs or send a bunch of emails out. We built that. And so we're like, okay, this has B2B use. Surely the lion's share of this water testing market, 99% of this water testing market is B2B. Let's go after it with this marketplace platform thing. So it wasn't like a total fool's errand. I think we were just a little bit overzealous. And like I said, we kind of betrayed our whole premise, which is like constantly go where people want you to go, where they're asking you to go. Don't try to force something. And so for a couple of years there, we were trying to force something. It made it a little bit slower for us to really get success on Simple Lab, I think. On that B2B solution, what was the incumbent solution and what were the pains which you were solving? Because the very simple parameter might be tested in house and then the advanced one be outsourced. But what is the number one thing which you're offering? Is it the ease of use? Is it a price? Is it the logistics? W what is it? There's no number one. And, There's and always a number one. Come on. It depends on the customer. So for like one person, it might be that like, hey, their boss told them to go get a bunch of testing done and they don't know how to do that. You can go in a simple lab and just do it. We've made it easy for that person. For someone else, it might be that like, you know, they don't want to spend a bunch of time negotiating with labs on prices. You can just go get a price right now on Simple Lab and order the kits. For someone else, it might be like, hey, I'm tired of using one PDF from Eurofins and another PDF from Pace and another PDF from my lab and another one from another lab and then reconciling all those EDDs. Simple Lab just gives you one data set, no matter which labs you're using. And this has been frustrating, honestly, like not knowing exactly what that one thing is, because you're right. There's always one thing. That's that's what makes it very easy to sell a product, I think, is when there is that really resounding one thing. For Simple Lab, I, I got to be honest, we haven't found that one thing yet. We've just found that there's a patchwork of problems different people are having in water and wastewater testing, lab testing in general. And we have to be very diligent about solving them all so that we can make our promise, which is like streamline 
simple lab. What's your relationship to the labs? When Booking.com started becoming the big thing it is, at the very beginning, hotels looked at it like it's going to be very easy for people to book their accommodations. And hence, that's pretty cool. But pretty fast, they understood that booking was taking an 18-person toll and that they won't be the one making the money anymore. The platform is going to make the money. Are you a kind of booking vampire or, <laughs> or do you have a symbiotic relationship to them? A difference here is that we do a lot of hard manual work. We run a warehousing business, a logistics business. So we are procuring materials, preparing sampling kits, taking kind of close track of inventory and shipping and carriers. And there's this element that we take on for the laboratory that they very much appreciate because it's not in the lab's core competency to be an outstanding fulfiller of test kits. Their core competency is great test results, accurate test results. By and large, I'm painting with a broad brush. There are some labs who do take fulfillment and customer support incredibly seriously. But by and large, it's very easy to go to a lab and say, hey, what if we did your fulfillment for you, didn't charge you anything for that, and in exchange, you tell us what you can do. And you work with us so that we can sell more product with you and for you. We all know this market is growing rapidly. Would you rather be doing your own fulfillment, running your own operations like you currently are, or let us take on some of that. In that process, we've been fortunate to be able to give almost every lab we work with just a lot of additional revenue. In the beginning, it was a little bit easier because it was all consumers. So it was like all business they were kind of turning away oftentimes. Okay, if someone comes to you and says, hey, this business you were currently turning away, you can now process and make more money on. They're super thrilled about that, obviously. It's gotten a little more complicated over time because we've had to demonstrate our value beyond bringing them additional customers. We've had to demonstrate our value in terms of providing them uh, even professional customers with fulfillment services and operations and logistics. If you're not charging the fulfillment to the laboratories, that means that you're adding a markup on their prices and that's what you're then charging to your end customers. So is that your business model or is there an additional trick I'm missing? Uh, one way to put it is this good anecdote. So there's a laboratory in Southern California that's running a bunch of regulatory 1,4 dioxane tests mm -hmm. on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Let's say there's some customer, mom or dad or a business in Michigan that needs 1,4 dioxane testing. They can either call up every lab and get every quote they can possibly get, spend hours doing that, and maybe eventually they find the laboratory that is already set up to run that 1,4 dioxane test, already certified to run the 1,4 dioxane test. But most likely they won't. Most likely they'll spend two or 300 bucks on a 1,4 dioxane test. Simple Lab knows there's a lab in Southern California that's running 1,4 dioxane Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we know that the marginal cost of adding one more sample there is about 10% of that price. So we can route the samples to the labs that can process them most quickly and most cheaply. And we can make that decision in microseconds. It's software. We don't need to call up all the labs. That's our business model. We effectively arbitrage that difference. We pass some of the savings onto the customer. We put some of the savings in our pocket, and then we send the sample to the lab that is optimal for that customer. If I try to put you very abruptly in a box, you're a broker of labs. Yeah. At the end of the day, you, you're pretty close to the investment banking <laughs> advice you received at the beginning, which is this arbitrage you, you mentioned. So it makes ton of sense. Sounds like very, very clever approach to the market. I thought at first, when looking up what you're doing and when looking up what 120 Water is doing, Megan was my guest by season three of the podcast. So it was long before the huge raises and series A she managed to grab last year. But I thought you would be competitors. And if I'm right, she is more of your customer. Ideally, yes. I mean, we have very different objectives. She and her team are building a compliance software. And we have not today, I think, ever competed on anything. I don't even know what that would look like because their role is to sell, I think, two utilities, an outstanding compliance dashboard and management system. I don't know very much about compliance. I don't think anyone on my team does. And it's incredibly complicated to get that right in every state, in every municipality, as the EPA and others change the game continuously, right? So we view our service as a plug-in to a service like 120, where, hey, your customers, in their efforts to be compliant, are going to need laboratory testing. And we build our entire product with APIs in mind. So you don't have to go into Simple Lab and order from Simple Lab directly using our interface. You can configure every kit you need every order you want to place inside of your own application so that you don't have to leave the 120 application. You don't have to leave the Jacobs or the Trinex application. You can order it and from and behind the scenes, we're the ones processing it. But you can kind of make that whole user experience 
inside of whatever application you want. So to get back to your question, no, I don't think Megan and or Ryan view us as competitors. We don't behave that way. And I'd like to think that we're actually just two peas in a pod working really hard to change the way a lot of things are being done. That's my point with the question. It's about this working hard because when you're alone opening a market, it can be super tricky and competition can help you because if you're explaining that there's a better way to do logistics, there's a better way to look at your lab testing, then you're not the lone prophet out there in the desert. So do you have competition or would you wish to have competition? Is it kind of a tricky thought to have as an entrepreneur? You always have competition. It might not be where you think it is and it might change over time. Our competition is, I think, most adequately summarized as the conventional approach to environmental sampling and testing, which means someone who needs to collect samples We'll call up the lab they normally use, request sampling materials, receive them, label them, bring them into FedEx, get the results back, et cetera. Changing behavior is our main competition. And that's a lot of competition. <laughs> we don't have, like I think, another company that's specifically taking an approach like ours and viewing the market the way we are, which I think is, is in, a, in a way nice, but there's a lot of people who say like, oh, it's great to have competitors. On tap score, we had competitors, but we beat them. <laughs> and that was easier in a way. But on Simple Lab, I think it's not clear if we have a specific competitor. I would like to think that there's going to be a time when all of the labs are able to really specialize and become outstanding at being labs. And the procurement of their service does not require each of those labs to do all of the stuff. Each of those labs should not be doing fulfillment and customer support phone calls and result data formatting into harmonized EDDs. Those are all ancillary services the lab has to provide to make their customers happy. Each of them doing it their own way is causing much more harm than good for them individually and for us all collectively, because that's making the process of understanding what's happening environmentally very complicated. It slowed down the way we get data. It slows down the way we get results. It slows down the way we analyze those results. So if our business can perform those ancillary roles, the support, the fulfillment, the logistics, the data harmonization, and every lab can plug into us. Heck, we can do a ton more testing at a much better price with much faster turnaround times. And the data is natively digital, meaning that you don't have to be translating results anymore from various PDFs so that you can write an annual report on water quality. It can all be happening dynamically. So that's our role. And in that role, we don't have a competitor. I guess Simple Lab is predictable in the sense that the parameters which B2B customer will ask you to analyze will be the ones linked to that compliance topic. For TAP score, I would imagine it to be a bit different. And I'm wondering if you've got like a bestseller, like there's one parameter that people right now would be ordering much more than the others. Oh man, dude, people are all over like PFAS and microplastics. It's weird being in this consumer business because we're kind of at odds with this idea of trusting tap water. We don't want to be. We are actually the ones who care, I think, as much as anyone else about the importance of trusting your tap water. The thing is, to get people to trust their tap water, you have to give them the resources to trust it. And that's testing. I haven't thought of another way. And so if people want to test PFAS, they want to test microplastics or pharmaceuticals in their tap water, you have to give it to them. You can't say, oh, no, no, you don't need that. So we end up doing a lot of that kind of testing. A lot of people who are very concerned about these things they see on social media or they see on the news. And from the conventional utility industry perspective, you would say like, oh, that's not necessary. You don't need to test your home's tap water for PFAS. There's no way you're going to collect that sample properly. But you have to give people that option. And you have to be very straightforward with them at the, at the same time about how important it is to collect that sample properly. Because of this role we play dealing with the consumer's Every day, thousands of people coming in and asking for all sorts of crazy tests. We are often, I think, misconstrued as, as an organization that's like somehow trying to like undermine trust in tap water. It couldn't be further from the truth. We love tap water. I drink tap water. I evangelize tap water as best I can. I think people should buy water filters if they want them. But I think a lot of people maybe misconstrue the fact that we sell a lot of these very esoteric tests as some kind of fear mongering, which it absolutely is not. It's about building that trust. Because most of the time when you take these tests, the results are negative. When you say the results, that's something I was curious about because TAP score implies there's a score. And as much as a B2B customer will want a PPM number, I would expect maybe a B2C customer to want a green, yellow, red type of approach. So how does it look oh, like? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is my favorite topic. Okay. So people have all sorts of backgrounds, right? Like some never went to college. Some got PhDs. Some studied science. Some studied 
a history of art. There are people who know what PPM stands for, and there's people who have no idea what a milligram is. And this is all fine. Our service needs to cater to all of them. In the beginning, we tried a number of things to do that. We tried to like, well, we kept thinking we understood the customer until maybe around 2020. We said, listen, new strategy. We will never understand our customer. Let's operate with that mindset. Build the product that is just constantly needing to adapt. And so what that means is when you get your report back, not only can you change the units, but you have tons of things you can read, animations, colors, clickable links. You can compare your results, not just to MCLs and MCLGs, because let's be honest, more than half of the United States doesn't even know what one of those things is. And again, that's fine. You can compare your results to the average bottled water we've tested. You can compare your results to the average person in your city, in your state. You can compare your results to all sorts of things. Context is king. And from beginning to end of our experience, we've had to accommodate a very wide net of user experience. And where we are today is like, you know what? Whatever your favorite flavor is, we're here to make sure you can have that with tap score. The score is a great idea of... <laughs> It's a great idea in theory, but kind of silly in retrospect. Obviously, simple lab users don't really care much about the score. We still had a foot in the door at Berkeley. The blood of academia flows swiftly through the veins of Tap Score and Simple Lab. We started there. We still live here. Our biggest warehouse is here. And we said, hey, we're going to spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of PhD hours to take all the epidemiological studies, all the toxicological studies, all the state and the federal and the nonprofit work on various contaminants and their health impacts. And we're going to synthesize all of that into an algorithm that scores water quality in terms of its chance of giving you either cancer or some other endpoint condition risk. This seemed like the most important thing in the world in 2019 to us. You can't ever get this right, but some people want the score. Some people don't care about any of the other stuff. The MCLs, the MCLGs, the bottled water, the average well owner in their county. They just want to see a score and a color. We've been through so many journeys like that to try and get this thing right. And when, you're, when you have a customer base like TapScore does, everyone, you need to build a product that can help everyone. And I'll say that with one caveat. It's still not that cheap. Paying like $200 for a water test is fine for some people, but for many people, it is still completely unaffordable and probably not even top of mind. And I think that's one of the most interesting challenges for TapScore moving forward is how, we, how we're able to unlock the majority of people who aren't thinking on top of mind, I need a water test and uh, I can't afford this $200 test. Cheap and, and the money is one thing. The other thing is you want to cater for everyone. Today, everyone is North America, right? Uh -huh, yeah. Today, everyone is North America, but tomorrow. That's my question. <laughs> maybe not literally tomorrow, but by next quarter, we will be in Europe. And that is very exciting. Tap score will be in Europe. And I'm super excited. One, it means more trips to Europe. <laughs> Two, it means opportunity to learn something totally new. It's going to be super interesting to see how we manage the kind of cultural and the language barriers associated with this effort, the economics. Like I, I know half of my family lives in Barcelona. Disposable income in Barcelona does not get spent like it does in the United States. So it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. And I also know that water is a major issue in Europe. It seems to be having a moment. And so our, our arrival in, in Europe, I think, will be especially interesting because of that confluence. So you're arriving in Europe or do you start with countries? Because the US speaks English, Canada speaks English. In Europe, it might be a bit more tricky. Yes, sir. Um, we're starting we're starting in English-speaking countries. So UK. Uh, simply, yeah, uh, Ireland, the okay. UK. And then from there, we'll probably move to Spanish-speaking countries Germany. Those are two languages. We have kind of some in-house. We have German and Spanish speakers on our team. My last name is Pujol. Mi papá nació en Barcelona. We are all fairly international as it is. Like I said, I think we're just very excited to do that. It's going to be fun. Like, French? What kind of water questions do people have there? We, we are going to need a, a you. Maybe maybe you could help us. <laughs> we have like a couple of people on our team who think they speak French. <laughs> but as you know, there's a big difference between thinking you speak French and actually speaking French. So rolling out to Europe happens this year in 2024 what's yeah. next what what do you aim to build what's the midterm and the long term goal well for tap score it's that individual experience of your drinking water which i think nobody before us has taken the approach we've taken which is information trust science from there you as an individual can make smart decisions about your drinking water what are those smart decisions well those are the topics the water industry is always talking about bottled water or not home filtration or not? Is PFAS a concern? Is lead a concern or not? 
you can't really answer those questions top down. We have tried for decades top down to tell people what they should be scared of and what they shouldn't be scared of. And there hasn't been a lot of grassroots up scientifically motivated endeavors like this to reinform people, to clear the chessboard and say, hey, we're with you from beginning to end. We're going to help you figure out your tap water so that you can make smart decisions about your tap water and so you can move on because this is tap water. This is not the most important thing in your life. That's the goal of tap score. And like always in the United States, tap score kind of sets the trail for Simple Lab. We learn a lot from that individual and we've learned that the individuals on the tap score side teach us a lot that we need to know on the Simple Lab side. So I think eventually we'll bring Simple Lab internationally as well. Not ready to do that yet though. Just one maybe tricky question, which I, I still want to take in, the, in that deep dive. You mentioned how you're comparing the results of someone's analysis to what's happening in the neighborhood, what's happening with the average of, of bottled water and so far and so on. That might be super valuable data for water filter companies if they knew that that specific region has quite now some troublesome analysis then for their sales pitch they probably would value that data pretty high is it something you're selling a load to sell willing to sell or totally off the off the table so we actually have a great question man we've been struggling for this one for so long we have a ton of water quality data as you imagine we let customers determine if their data is public or private. And we do anonymize some of it so that we can merge it with publicly available data from states and federal government in the United States. And we present it out publicly. We have a, a URL, citywater.mytapscore.com. You can type in any city in the country and you can see all the data anonymized. So you, you, know, you can't see exactly whose results are whose, but you can see for that city, averages, maximums, well water, city water. And it's not just your standard consumer confidence report information. It's all of the testing we've done. Very cool. It's free. And we're not afraid of releasing that data because we think more information means smarter customers, which helps us and others. Citywater.mytapscore.com, very cool resource where you can search water quality data dynamically as it's updated regularly. Now, every week, there's a filtration company that reaches out to effectively, you know, wants to buy our customer list or something. And the answer is just flat out, no, we would lose everyone's trust, feel pretty crummy about ourselves. And frankly, the whole team would probably just quit if we sold that data to filtration providers. We're a lab testing company. You have to choose who you are at one point. And we are unbiased and we are independent for you. We can't also take that information and despite what we thought in the beginning, make money on both sides of this thing. We can't. So we chose our side. Our site is the individual and the consumer, and we will follow them to the end of the earth. Now, filtration companies can test with Simple Lab. They can set up Simple Lab accounts. They can build their own testing projects for their own customers and give their customers test kits. They can do that all day long and build bigger businesses with customers who trust them with their water quality as a result of that. And that's the closest we've gotten to being able to, 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 to do that. But I will say that on every one of our reports, the TAP score reports, there's a treatment recommendation. And we tell you what technologies you need. We don't name the brands specifically. We tell you what technologies you need. And then you can go and find a brand. There's an integration there where you can find WQA professional, Water Quality Association professional. There's a couple of other integrations, but there's no affiliate fees. There's no there's no sharing of data with those filtration companies. I don't want to open the food sidetrack, but I could see how you wouldn't be betraying your customers or your team by still doing affiliation because you're not selling anything. You're just saying, just in case we've validated those filters, uh, we come from a filtration background, so we might have one thought or two about what's working or not. But I don't want to. No, no, that's a good. It's a good question. I mean, we think about this all the time. We know we're leaving like millions and millions of dollars on the table, but we also know that if we open that can of worms, it might be a slippery slope. And I'm very scared of that slippery slope. I think what is better long term is for all the filtration companies to use Simple Lab and provide testing to their customers and for customers to buy testing. And while I think the internet has obviously proliferated the virtues of affiliate fees left and right, it has also created a bunch of mess, right? It's like, can I trust this person? Or are they just trying to make money on getting me to click? You know, And that distrust is a bigger issue than we're prepared to take on. And so it's very easy. It's actually nice for us to be able to market and be proud of the fact that we don't do that. Thankfully, we're, we're, we're able to make enough money anyway. But yeah, it is a good point. We think about it regularly how do we tie this knot because people at home often come to us even complaining that we don't give them a recommendation on a product to buy they're like oh just tell me what product to buy and we have to kind of tell them why we don't tell them what product to buy but we give them resources this is how you can figure out what product to buy. so 
you handled the tricky questions very right, so I have to ask you one more. Will John Robinson get his exit? Or will you buy him out because you want to build a giant and you don't want to exit? <laughs> He'll definitely get his exit. I mean, we've got such a great cap table. Like I was thinking in advance, you know, I know you like numbers and, you know, we haven't raised a ton of money. We haven't disclosed a lot about our, our business in general. We have a very intimate cap table. It's Christmas dinner every time we meet. I love the feeling I get working with our investors. John's very unique, but all of our investors, I really love the relationship I have with them. I can't imagine running a business that had like 40 investors and trying to manage those relationships and the politics behind them and somehow still building the right product. I want a small number of extremely passionate, motivated investors, and I want to make them just as rich and successful as I think our team and our whole industry wants to be. So if we do ever raise money again, I'll look for someone with the same amount of passion as John Robinson and every one of our other investors. I honestly, I mean, this is going to sound like just obnoxious California CEO talking like, I really want to go public. I think our business can go public. I think the world needs a platform for laboratory testing of the environment. I think there's a plan to get there. When that day comes, hopefully everyone... You're not the first one to say that you want to, to go public on that microphone. No. Not that <laughs> others, I wouldn't believe them, but others, I, I could envision a path to exit to a, a major, which is so straightforward that I would bet they won't go public. In your case, it is true that it, it resembles the type of business which typically goes public. So I would be amazed to see that. So it's it's me in my in my humble studio just uh, just to sing things which are much bigger than me. So <laughs> oh, me too. Man, for all I know, they're gonna figure out all the water problems and no one's gonna need to do any more testing next year. <laughs> that would that would be a problem for us. There's all sorts of things ahead. Um yeah, that's the good thing is that your risk of getting disrupted and getting out of the market is so limited because yeah, the, the challenges when it comes to water are not getting easier. And with infrastructure, which is you'll see that when you roll out in Europe, it's crumbling. So great opportunity for mm. testing. I would see that's the positive. There's a negative to that, but that's another story. <laughs> I don't want to take too much of your time, Johnny, because uh, I'm already being too French here and going over the board. If that's fine for you, I propose you to switch to the rapid fire questions. It's time for the rapid fire questions. What is the toughest challenge in your opinion for a water tech startup? Weeding through the noise of the industry. A lot of noise, a lot of misdirections out there, I think. What would be your best single piece of advice for the founders and managers of the about 1000 early stage water startups? Figure out what will get you happy paying customers and do that right away. What's the drop of knowledge you wish more investors knew about the water sector? I'm surprised how few invest, this isn't really knowledge, it's more like I wish more investors were investing on the consumer side of things. It's super interesting down here. <laughs> You know, it's a weird world on the consumer side of water, but I don't see a lot of investors investing on the consumer side of it. So I, I, that would be fun and cool because I love working with other startups. I think that's the multiplier. I have to heavily refrain me to, to go down a sidetrack here because I'm fascinated by that, uh, especially the water filter, water ionizer, all these B2C approaches. Yeah. It's, you're totally right. It's an untold story in, in the water sector and it's a multi tens of billions annual market, which kind of just exists, grows faster than anything else in the market and still doesn't get the attention of more shiny stuff. But a lot of the incubators are really, or the like the investors are really focused on this. I think because they come from that world, they come from the world of utilities and engineering solutions uh, for utilities that they bring that focus to the startup community, but it's not serving the industry or the people as much as it could be if they were bringing consumer energy to that. The, the full sidetrack is about, does one eventually eat up the other? But I, I don't want to open the box now because uh, if we do, <laughs> we're still here in one hour. It's gonna be fascinating, Fair. but you have a rest of the day on my end of the word, the day is over, so I can ramble. <laughs> right. What's your most unexpected partnership and what did it bring to you? Honestly, the laboratories. Uh, from day one, we were like, are they going to be cool with this? It took us years to feel no more imposter syndrome and to be able to speak with labs and to be able to really understand that they love the service we're providing. It was very surprising. In the beginning, we thought they're going to think we're competing with them. But that never turned out to be the case. It turned out to be there's plenty of food on the table here, one. And number two, there's many things we can do that they appreciate and want us to work on. Super short, profitability or growth? 
profitability. I was surprised that you hesitated because everything you said so far lend into that direction. But but again, I'm stopping with the side tracks. <laughs> It's great. What's the next profile you'll hire? Someone with a background in analytical chemistry and limbs. When you hire in general, do you look at sector experience or startup experience? I look for we look for someone who has a strong desire to learn and be great. They will work hardest. They'll figure it out and they'll be excited. And I want that. I think you kind of answered that one but asking nevertheless opening new markets or doubling down on the current ones i don't know i can hear my dad telling me right now you you have to do both all the time you really you, yeah you have to do both all the time because you just don't know what the future brings and you need to be doubling down on what you're good at so that it's giving you more fuel in the tank and you need to be expanding so that it's giving you more fuel in the tank you can't be lazy and turn your head on one of those two things i think you have to do them both hard what's that tool nobody speaks about but you couldn't live without google calendar it's surprising how often that one comes up so uh, yeah good one does it yeah. really oh darn <laughs> i was hoping i was being unique you know damn What's the single piece of insight your ideal customer profile needs to hear right now? On the Simple Lab side, your technical support team, strengthen them, uh, learn how to integrate with APIs. That's the best way to take advantage of all the amazing work that's happening on the startup scene. Like most of the businesses like Simple Lab that are kind of pouring energy and time and money into figuring out better, faster solutions, or at least proposed solutions, you need to plug into them at some point or perish. And the way of pl plugging in with them are APIs. And I, I, it's shocking to me how many businesses, how many business leaders don't know what an API is in the water sector. It's less shocking to me, but <laughs> 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 what are you desperately needing and want to raise an open call for right now? God, I can't even think of something. You're fulfilled. Desperately. <laughs> Journalists should do more research before they write articles about water. I'm not desperate for that, but it is weird how often I read mainstream journalist, journalism that like totally gets it wrong. I don't know if that's the case in everything, but 40 second commentary on that one. <laughs> First, yeah, please. I fully agree with you. Second, we had that discussion uh, at the Rethinking Water conference. We did a, a panel on that in, in New York last year, and there, there seems to be an agreement on that. Third, you might be right on we notice because we are from that sector. And I remember specifically looking at a bunch of Michael Moore movie and thinking, you know, it's probably over the top, but it's Michael Moore, it's his style, everything. And then he did the one on Flint and I was like, mm, I understand one thing or two about water. So it sounds like that is really over the board sometimes. And then mm. you start to wonder if it's always the case and you don't notice because you're not an expert. So I don't have the answer, but I share the, the, the questioning which, which, which you have. Last question, what can and should I do for you? You could help us uh, translate our tap score into French. I have 31 bottles of water just on the under my desk because mm -hmm. I'm preparing a piece of content about that. So if we can find an agreement on you get me some 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 tests, I can translate a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Hell yeah, I'm in. <laughs> That's great. Johnny, if people want to follow up with you, uh, where should I redirect them the best? Hello at gosimplelab.com. Like always, the link is in the description. Just check it out. I think, I hope people could perceive how <laughs> easy going and very, very cool the guy you are with that conversation. So I hope you will get some inquiries. And if you don't, just I will have to, to scream at the people myself and say, come on, <laughs> do it. So thanks a lot. Yeah, and I hope to get to speak to you again because we, we left a lot of doors open and there are lots of additional rabbit holes which I'd like to explore in the future. Hey, me too. Thanks for the privilege. What can we learn from Johnny's path from selling vacuum cleaners on QVC to rolling out a network of water quality testing across North America and Europe? And the close future may be leading Simple Lab to IPO? Well, quite a lot, starting with the seven insights I wrote down. And number one, customer driven innovation. Simple Lab targets a growing public concern contaminants in home drinking water. That concern regularly spikes in the aftermath of sanitary crises, like in the early days of TAPSCORE when the Flint event was still hot in everyone's minds. As Johnny told us, There were people at home who wanted to know what was in their drinking water. They had questions, concerns. We started really 
focused on the individual mom or dad, somebody who didn't have a background, a professional background in either analytical chemistry or in toxicology or water quality or water at all. That's why Johnny and his co-founder Julio smartly positioned themselves at the intersection of consumer needs and market opportunity, addressing water safety fears with a straightforward solution. Where did they get their idea from? Well, in number two, flexibility in business strategy. Indeed, as Johnny reveals, Simple Lab was born from a pivotal shift inspired by observing keen interest during community visits and a timely suggestion from his father while he was considering ditching his company at the time that specialized in arsenic removal. Before you throw this thing out, what's working? And I said, okay, we were going to these towns in Central Valley and uh, the best part about it is that when we tell them what's in their drinking water because we've run a test, everyone is listening. They love it. They want to know about arsenic. They want to know about uranium. They want to know about pH. They want to know about TDS. And they're curious about all these heavy metals. It's like suddenly the quiet classroom has come alive. I told him that and I was like, there's the answer. And he said it right like at dinner. He's like, you should just sell water tests. Much like how Instagram zoomed in on photo sharing after experimenting with multiple features, Simple Lab hones in on water testing, turning a side feature into a main attraction and boom, instant success. Yet I bet you they could be making more money in a breeze, which might be a terrible idea because of number three, maintaining customer trust. Simple Lab values the long game over quick profits by refusing to sell consumer data despite lucrative offers. Johnny emphasizes the importance of integrity. Man, we've been struggling for this one for so long. We have a ton of water quality data, as you imagine. Every week, there's a filtration company that reaches out to effectively you know, wants to buy our customer list or something. And the answer is just flat out, no, we would lose everyone's trust, feel pretty crummy about ourselves, and frankly, the whole team would probably just quit if we sold that data to filtration providers. This commitment reinforces their reputation as a trustworthy consumer-centric brand Go check them on Reddit. First, you won't find many water companies that answer their customers on Reddit. But second, you'll also notice that people praise this integrity in Simple Labs approach. Number four, leveraging digital tools for marketing and efficiency. It's not every day that you can adopt a lean startup approach in water endeavors, yet it paid off handsomely for Simple Lab. Sometimes you just have to build an MVP and test your hypothesis. As Johnny recounts, we were able to run ads on a very basic Shopify store and actually have a great ROI on those ads quickly. Meaning to say people were searching for water testing kits and we were running ads, dinky ads. Like we barely had the ability to create the graphics we needed. We had no idea of what copy was gonna sell a water test. We had a storefront that was built by an entire team that had never worked in the water industry before. And we were still able to make money selling water testing kits. And more importantly, we were able to make people happy. Sometimes you should not think twice before giving your gut feeling a chance. Johnny and Julio felt they hit a nerve with water quality testing. Well, I doubt it took more than three hours to have their Shopify up and running and three weeks to ensure it was a solid business idea. Number five, scaling through user-friendly services. Simplifying complex water testing processes has has been key to Simple Labs customer appeal. Johnny describes their approach. We make all of that easy. You can be anyone. And with Simple Lab, we've streamlined that whole experience of like ordering test kits. Understanding is key. We just make that whole process of ordering test kits, collecting the samples, sending them into the laboratory, getting the results back easy. This demystification ensures that no customer needs to be a scientist to understand their water quality. And that's great because customers that are no scientists are clearly the majority keep it simple, stupid, and reap the benefits. Number six, strategically phased international expansion. Johnny outlines a calculated approach to international expansion, starting with English speaking countries to ease cultural and linguistic transitions. He notes, Today everyone is North America, but tomorrow. That's my question. <laughs> Maybe not literally tomorrow, but by next quarter, we will be in Europe. And that is very exciting. This methodical expansion allows Simple Lab to adjust and tailor their offerings in manageable phases. Focus, step by step, build and repeat. That may sound trivial, but it's important to remind everyone. And number seven, building strong partnerships. Effective collaborations, especially with laboratories, enhance Simple Lab service capabilities. Johnny highlights the mutual benefits. We run a warehousing business, a logistics business. So we are procuring materials, preparing sampling kits, taking kind of close track of inventory and 
shipping and carriers. And there's this element that we take on for the laboratory that they very much appreciate because it's not in the lab's core competency to be an outstanding fulfiller of test kits. These strategic partnerships allow labs to focus on their expertise while Simple Lab manages the logistics, creating a synergistic relationship that boosts efficiency and satisfaction. It's sometimes hard to resist doing everything yourself, but it's pretty always the right thing to do. And there you have it, my seven insights from Johnny Pujol in under seven minutes. If you disagree with my selection, tell me. And if you'd like to dive deeper, well, listen to the full interview. You can also jump straight into the chapters. I'm paving the road. Now it's on you to take action. Remember, that episode came to you free of charge, but I would believe not free of value. It takes me quite some time to put all of those together every week, so all I'm asking is for you to help me distribute them. So take this episode, share it with a colleague, a friend, your boss, or your team, and I'll be back with another one next week. Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.